In the case of the University of Colorado's law school, complying with the ABA's demands involved spending more than $40 million for a new building. And this and other cost increases led to a rise in annual law school tuition from $6,700 to $16,738 for Colorado residents and to $30,814 for non-residents. This more than doubling of tuition in just a few years undoubtedly put the University of Colorado's law school beyond the reach of some low-budget students. It also protected high-cost law schools from the competition of the University of Colorado Law School's previous low tuition and made it more difficult for other low-cost law schools to arise to compete with high-cost law schools. In short, the ABA's accreditation standards and practices served much the same role as a protective tariff insulating high-cost producers from the competition of low-cost producers. A commission report to the U.S. Department of Education criticized the ABA's accreditation practices for continuing to seek to dictate operational policies, such as terms and conditions of employment, that are unrelated to the quality of learning, institutional effectiveness or integrity, add unnecessary costs to the student and the public, and intrude upon institutional autonomy. Few law schools could risk operating without accreditation, as the Nashville School of Law has done, depending on its low tuition to attract students and depending on its graduates' ability to pass the state bar exam to maintain the institution's reputation. While graduates of the Nashville School of Law who have passed the state bar exam can practice law in Tennessee, and many have gone on to successful careers there, their law degrees from an unaccredited institution may not be accepted everywhere else. A scholarly study of the American Bar Association's accreditation practices in general concluded, The economic impacts of law school accreditation are shaped by both the accreditation process and by the ABA's substantive standards. The process and standards may or may not increase the quality of legal education. However, a main impact of the process and standards is to increase salaries and benefits for existing law school faculty. The process and requirements provide benefits to faculty directly. They directly require high salaries, short working hours, and ample benefits. In addition, the process and requirements provide benefits indirectly by erecting daunting barriers to entry for new law schools and faculties, and so reducing competitive pressures. Although the ABA's standards are ostensibly aimed at maintaining educational quality, its actual effect in that respect is by no means obvious while its effect as a protection for existing traditional law schools, and especially for professors at these institutions, is far more visible. The same study noted, the Association of American Law Schools each year administers a hiring conference for law school faculty. Over the last five years, 5,642 people have applied through the AALS recruiting process for faculty positions at law schools. Only 638, or 11.3 percent of them, got jobs. Many of these people might be willing to work for less than those who already have jobs. As members of recruiting committees often note, many of the unsuccessful applicants are more qualified than existing faculty, with degrees from more prestigious institutions, better law school grades, and more publications. While law schools are unusual in that there is an independent, objective, and career-relevant test of their graduates' education, and therefore a check on the relevance of the accrediting agency's criteria, other accrediting agencies for colleges and universities tend to have input criteria much like those of the ABA, with little or no regard to output quality, and with similar indulgences of the preconceptions of members of the accrediting agency. As the American Council of Trustees and Alumni reported, 
Sometimes accreditors insist that the college's academic goals be subordinated to the accreditor's own social vision. Several of the accrediting associations have chosen to include among their standards a requirement that colleges and universities admit students and hire faculty and other personnel on the basis of race and other demographic characteristics. Too often, the arbitrary focus on inputs produces both higher costs and lower educational quality. As the same report noted, Accreditors sometimes apply recipes for educational inputs that result in misallocated resources or even undermine educational outcomes. For example, some accreditors have demanded low faculty teaching loads. Campbell University in North Carolina was placed on probation because its standard faculty teaching load was 15 hours per week. The accreditor insisted that 12 hours was the maximum acceptable load, so the school solved the problem by consolidating class sections. Instead of the relatively small classes the students had expected, especially in freshman and sophomore courses, after the accreditation visit, students often found themselves in classes of 60 or more. Not all accrediting agencies will accredit private, profit-based institutions like the University of Phoenix, and some colleges refuse to accept students' credits earned at such institutions, regardless of quality. Because proprietary colleges are usually accredited by national rather than regional accrediting agencies, some colleges refuse credits from such institutions whose accreditation is not the same as their own. Such practices reinforce the barriers against less expensive forms of higher education. Thus, traditional academic institutions, which have inherited large costs from the past, such as tenure for many professors or large libraries with expensive upkeep, are protected from the competition of lower-cost newcomers who can avoid the costs of such practices through the use of electronically available books and journals and a high proportion of non-tenured faculty. The net result is that there are fewer competitive pressures to reduce tuition or even to inhibit continuing rises in tuition. Despite misuses of the accreditation process, some standards of quality control are obviously required. No one should assume that either profit-seeking or non-profit institutions automatically live up to quality standards or even standards of honesty. A number of lawsuits claim that unaccredited for-profit institutions have misled students into believing that their credits would be automatically transferable to other institutions and their degrees recognized, when in fact neither claim was true.